After years of managing to escape the law, Joaquin Arquivaldo Guzman Loera, famously known as El Chapo, finally had his criminal spree come to an end in July of 2019. After being caught, the Mexican drug lord was transferred to America's most secure supermax prison, ADX Florence in Colorado. For years, the ADX remained a mystery, but in this video, we'll get a glimpse of life inside the so-called impenetrable fortress. The Alcatraz of the Rockies the United States Penitentiary Administrative Maximum Facility in Florence, Colorado, or simply ADX Florence, is the highest security prison in the country. It is known as the Alcatraz of the 21st century, or the Alcatraz of the Rockies. Another way to describe it was famously said by former warden Robert Hood, who claimed that ADX was a clean version of hell. I don't know what hell is, but I do know that the, the, you know, the, the assumption would be for a free person it's pretty would be pretty close to it. The facility was built in 1994 in an unincorporated and remote area located about 100 miles south of Denver and 40 miles south of Colorado Springs, literally in the middle of nowhere. It was conceived to follow the Marion Federal Penitentiary model in the region, meaning that the state of Colorado wanted its own all lockdown and maximum isolation prison. The ADX uses a control unit system and was designed to fulfill a simple mission, incarcerate the worst of the worst, the most irredeemable types of criminals. As described by the former director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, Norman Carlson, ADX is the place for a very small subset of the inmate population who show absolutely no concern for human life. There are basically two ways to enter the select group and to get into ADX. The first one is to become a serial killer of a violent type, responsible for attacking guards and other prisoners while serving time. The second is to become a notorious criminal that threatens national security. That makes the ADX home for many notorious criminals, like the Unabomber Ted Kaczynski, Oklahoma City bombers Terry Nichols and Timothy McVeigh, Atlanta Olympic Park bomber Eric Rudolph, FBI supervisor turned Soviet spy Robert Hansen, mob informant Sammy the Bull Gravano, the 1993 World Trade Center bomber Ramzi Youssef, 9-11 conspirator Zakarias Musawi, Umar Farouk Abdul Mutalab, the serial killer Dr. Michael Swango, and most recently Kingpin El Chapo, just to name a few. Still, housing such notorious figures brings great responsibility to guarantee that those criminals will stay locked up. That, however, is the slightest of troubles for the ADX complex when we consider that the penitentiary was built to be what every prison presumably tries to accomplish, to be absolutely escape-proof. But what exactly gives ADX such a reputation? The reputation of ADX Florence. To put it simply, it's got the strictest possible regime, the toughest one ever seen inside prison doors, both in its operation and in its structure. ADX can house up to 500 inmates, but never works at full capacity. The Federal Bureau of Prisons prefers a high staff to inmate ratio, for obvious security reasons. They go further by being very strict about hiring their staff. Not everyone can work at the facility. If one is interested, one must be vetted so that anyone corrupt or suspicious gets prevented from getting inside. Besides, the guards are order to have as little contact with the prisoners as possible. They are told not to look the convicts in the eye and not to talk to them if not necessary, which in fact may not be very hard, considering that most of the work, like opening doors, takes place remotely in ADX. It is a very monotonous routine, almost as much as the inmates' ones. Robert Hood himself said once, the supermax is life after death. It's long term. In my opinion, it's far much worse than death. Something that helps build this unsettling atmosphere inside ADX is its absolute silence and immaculate cleanliness. Former inmates and journalists who had the chance of visiting the facility on a rare occasion in 2007 often describe how surprisingly clean the place was and the disturbing, deadly silence that reigns throughout. I knew when I was there, this was hell. The silence is deafening. They will shoot you with a regular bullet. No questions asked. I will guarantee you every single person in the ADX Superman would do anything to trade with Guantanamo Bay. The prison has six different security levels, but due to its low population, there are reportedly only four units in operation. The General Housing Unit, the Control Unit, the Special Security Unit, also known as H Unit, and Range 13. The other two units not currently operating are the Special Housing Unit and the Intermediate or Transitional Unit. The General Population Unit is the lowest security level. Inmates located there get to socialize and share a dining room. They are also allowed to walk in their own range without being escorted by guards and can 
can secure themselves in their own rooms. If they have good behavior and don't cause any problems with guards and other prisoners, they can even get transferred to another prison. Following the general population unit comes the control unit. This unit is used for both punishments and housing convicts who have committed serious conduct violations or acts of violence at other institutions. Plus, members of prison gangs and members of other high-level organizations that are considered a national threat. Next up is the special security unit where notorious terrorists are kept, like Terry Nichols, Umar Farouk Abdul Mutalab, and Zakarias Musawi. And last but not least, there is the ultra-secure and most severe unit, Range 13. This is a four-cell wing where the prisoners have virtually no human contact. Only a few criminals are considered so dangerous to be ever locked up in there. Ramzi Yusuf was one of them, staying there for more than seven years. And most recently, that is where El Chapo began living out his sentence. But how is life at this ultra-max unit? Inside El Chapo's supermax cell, well, this is where ADX proves itself as having the most elaborate anti-escape infrastructure out there. Basically, every single corner is foolproof. Prisoners essentially spend all of their time alone. They are locked up in their 7 by 12 foot cells 23 hours a day and are guarded around the clock by armed escorts. The cell's thick walls, ceilings, and floors are made out of solid concrete, and everything in it is built into the cell infrastructure. Each cell has a small desk, a stool that is barely big enough for inmates to sit on, and a concrete bed with a thin mattress. Close to it is a small shelf with a built-in radio and a black and white TV that only broadcasts recreational, religious, and educational programs. There's also a bathroom with a toilet that gets automatically shut off in case of a blockage, a shower that comes with a timer to prevent prisoners from drowning themselves, and a sink with no tap to prevent prisoners from harming themselves. The cells also have double sets of sliding metal doors with solid exteriors that separate the cell from the hallways so prisoners can't see one another. They also keep the inmates from knowing when guards are passing or when people are in the facility at any given time. Plus, the doors help to reinforce the feeling of isolation and allow the guards to pass the prisoners food without even seeing their faces. They are fed mostly mashed food so they can't harm themselves. Inmates also can't hear each other since the cells are soundproofed. That prevents prisoners from communicating with each other by neither shouting nor using Morse code. The cell also comes with a window. That is, if you can call such a narrow slit in the wall a window. It is about 42 inches tall, but only four inches wide. This clearly wasn't made for inmates like El Chapo to chill and get a view of the mountains outside. All they can see when they look through it is a glimpse of the sky and the other prison roofs around. So inmates won't have a clue about where they are and how to escape from there. In fact, this cell feels much more like a tomb for the living. Nothing there is made to make you feel comfortable. The lights in the cells are also controlled remotely by guards. They are reportedly left on at all times to also confuse the prisoners about the passing of time. Without much differentiation between day and night, El Chapo even affirmed to his lawyer once that he finds it very hard to sleep due to the lights never turning off. Impossible to escape. For one hour a day, the prisoners are allowed out. They are picked up from their cells, strip-searched, handcuffed, chained, and escorted out for a walk alone. However, this recreational period is not consistent. It can come at any time of the day or night and without any warning, making it difficult for prisoners to plan a possible escape. However, this daily event isn't necessarily a relief for convicts to enjoy the outside, since they are not taken to a yard, but a small, empty swimming pool, meaning they can't see over the walls to have a clue about their location, and it only takes a few steps, 10 steps diagonally and 31 steps in a circle, to be more exact, to walk from one end to another, turning this into a rather dull, monotonous and tiring exercise. On rare occasions for good behavior, prisoners can get this walk exchanged for a call to a limited circle of people, including a lawyer. Nevertheless, each convict has the right to make one 15-minute non-legal phone call a month. They can also get visitors if well-behaved, but are not allowed to touch anyone. They will always be separated from anyone who visits by a thick glass window. Needless to say, the convicts are under surveillance 24 hours a day. All over the prison, there are motion detectors and hidden cameras monitoring all of the inmates' movements. Officers not only surveil the facility's doors with a remote control, but also monitor every single part of ADX from a control room. If they spot anything strange or suspicious taking place anywhere, they can hit a panic button, which will automatically lock all the 1,400 doors in the prison and prevent any escape. This remote surveillance goes further with the use of pressure pads, 
and motion sensors both inside and outside the cells, sending off an alert if someone happens to stand in one of them. But what if someone manages to get past all of that, you ask? Well, they would have to scale a 12-foot tall razor wire fence in front of heavily armed guards in one of the prison's many towers, while other guards are walking around with attack dogs just waiting for them. I mean, if you're willing to place some of the most dangerous men in the world in one place, you want to make sure that they'll stay there no matter what. And without ever registering a single escape attempt, the ADX seems to be living up to its own reputation. With that being said, it's easy to see why this was the place chosen by American authorities to make El Chapo fulfill his life sentence after finally getting caught and extradited to the US. Having previously escaped jail two times, it seems like El Chapo finally got to the end of the road. Highway to Hell Known as one of the most terrifying crime bosses ever, El Chapo rose to power in the 1980s as chief of the Sinaloa drug cartel in Mexico. For 25 years, he ruled a gang of thugs and hitmen who killed all the unruly and secured his operations. In a short period of time, El Chapo had already built an empire and had a net worth of billions of dollars. Eventually, he was caught in Guatemala after a massive manhunt and sent to Mexico to serve a 20-year sentence at a maximum security prison in Amaloya de Juarez, and later transferred to a maximum security prison of Puente Grande. There, however, it seemed like El Chapo was living in a resort rather than a prison. That's because he had almost all of the guards and prison staff working under his payroll, as if he was the unofficial warden of the facility. El Chapo truly enjoyed a lavish lifestyle during his first imprisonment. He would hold parties in his cell. All of his wishes were granted, and on top of all of that, he managed to continue his business out of the prison through the phone. But one day, El Chapo apparently got sick of the whole thing and decided to leave. He then escaped prison by by hiding inside a laundry basket in 2001. Afterward, he lived on the run and continued to freely rule his illegal business. At the time, he was the world's most wanted criminal. I mean, until he was captured for the second time on the 21st of February 2014. Mexican and American authorities joined up to locate El Chapo and managed to arrest him in a beach resort in the city of Mazatlan. However, his second time in jail was just a short hiatus from his criminal activities. On July 11th, 2015, El Chapo escaped once again. This time, he had his associate dig a 1.5 kilometer tunnel under the prison with an opening in his cell shower floor. By the time guards realized what was happening, the kingpin was already on a motorcycle riding far away from there. Unluckily for El Chapo, this time his freedom didn't last very long. American and Mexican forces teamed up once again on Operation Black Swan, and on January 8, 2016, El Chapo was recaptured once again. But little did the drug lord know that this time it was for good. On January 19, 2017, the worst possible outcome for El Chapo and his biggest fear came to place. He was informed he would be extradited to the United States. The party was over. There, the criminal was found guilty on various charges, including engaging in continuing criminal operations, narcotics trafficking, using a firearm in drug crimes, and money laundering. He was sentenced to life in prison plus 30 years without the possibility of parole, and since has disappeared. At first, not even his lawyers knew where he was. That is because on July 19, 2019, El Chapo was moved to his newest and current residence, ADX Florence. The thing Americans and Mexicans quickly understood is that with El Chapo's wit, power, and influence, the only place that could hold him tight would be the ADX. When asked if he thought El Chapo could escape this time, Robert Hood said, to me, there is no doubt he will try to escape as far as his job is to get out. I think he'll test the system. How difficult would it be for him to even try to escape? Well, no one has so far since 1994 when they opened. But in El Chapo type of confinement at the Supermax, he will be in his cell about 23 hours a day. He'll have cameras all over him. A light at the end of the tunnel? In his Range 13 cell, El Chapo is constantly reminded of how isolated he is, and how this time it seems like there really is no way out, not even for him. However, one can think that if even Alcatraz wasn't 100% escape-proof, couldn't El Chapo escape from the ADX? Let's see. First, El Chapo would have to get out of his cell. Digging tunnels is not an option here. In the first place, he would have to plow through some pretty well-reinforced concrete. Secondly, he would have to try to get past the unavoidable pressure pads, motion detectors, and the small cameras camera in the ceiling of his cell, which would catch any suspicious movement instantly. A possible option would be to bribe a guard. Nevertheless, that is very unlikely to happen, since all guards have been vetted. The only possibility for this to work would be if El Chapo's men kidnapped his family or something like that. But even if he would be taken out of his cell by a guard, he would be closely watched by the control room. Considering that only one man moves at a time, that would make it very difficult for him to pass the pressure pads, motion detectors, the guards up in the towers, the guards and dogs outside, and the massive barbed wire 
defense. Even if El Chapo had a hacker to corrupt the system and open the doors, he would have to face those guards and dogs. The only way he might get past all of this would be by having a considerable number of his men just outside the facility to bring him out safely. However, these men would be easily spotted by the staff since they would be in the middle of nowhere. And needless to say, as many thugs as El Chapo could summon there, let's not forget that the guys responsible for guarding the ADX are the literal American military, who probably would leave El Chapo's men outnumbered pretty quickly. And again, the structure of ADX makes it impossible for El Chapo or any of the inmates to know where in the prison they are, so getting locational information to men on the outside is impossible. In short, it seems like the only way El Chapo is getting out of ADX is in Hollywood's next blockbuster movie. The drug lord himself has said once that living in his cell at the Florence Maximum facility has been torture and the most inhumane situation I have ever lived in my entire life. It has been physical, emotional, and mental torture. He also told his lawyer that due to those oppressive conditions, he regularly throws up and has headaches and sinus trouble. Yeah, it looks like there's really no room for partying this time around. A nightmarish reality. But this has also sparked some conversation over ADX Florence's methodology. Some human rights organizations, such as Amnesty International, have questioned the methods and design of ADX Florence. Former inmates often talk about the inhumane conditions to which they were subjected at the prison. Rodney Jones, a man arrested after getting three assault charges within a year against fellow inmates, was transferred to ADX in 2003. In an interview with the New York Times in 2015, he recalled what was a day in hell. He claimed the staff psychiatrist stopped giving him a medicine he took for bipolar polar disorder, justifying that they don't give out feel-good drugs there. As a result, Jones experienced severe mood changes and initially tried to cope by working out in his cell to exhaust himself, but then eventually even started to cut himself. The guards responded by fastening his arms and legs to his bed in a somewhat medieval torture procedure. Jones also mentioned how, at ADX, he could observe some inmates that clearly had severe mental issues and had no conditions for staying under such a strict regime. He then told the story of Michael Bacote, an illiterate man that suffered from acute paranoia, whom he spotted in the recreation yard once. Bacote was sent to ADX for being a lookout for a murder at a prison in Texas, and was not dealing very well at the new penitentiary. He reportedly made numerous requests for transfer and some proper psychological treatment, but was always denied. Jones then ghosted a query to a pro bono legal aid group he knew, the DC Prisoners Project, pretending to be Bacote. When the director of the project, Deborah Golden, got acquainted with the situation, she stated, it was inconceivable to me that the Bureau of Prisons could be operating in such a blatantly illegal and unconstitutional manner. Referring to the officer's regulations of forbidding inmates who show evidence of significant mental disorder in penitentiaries like ADX. Golden went deeper and realized that there were dozens of similar stories from other ADX prisoners. They involved self-mutilation, psychosis, and even suicide. After some further investigation, in 2012, a class action lawsuit was filed against the U.S. Bureau of Prisons. It claims that several inmates have been diagnosed with insanity while incarcerated at the ADX, and others with previously existing conditions have noticeably worsened. Also, it stated that putting mentally unstable prisoners in the maximum isolated conditions is practically mental torture. Everyone knows that prisons are not supposed to be nice and comfortable places, but it doesn't mean that they have to be borderline torture chambers. It's no surprise that some call ADX an incubator for mental illness. El Chapo's Health one of El Chapo's trial attorneys, Jeffrey Lichtman, expressed concern saying that supermax conditions amounted to more torture. Dr. Terry Coopers, a psychiatrist who wrote the book Solitary, the inside story of supermax isolation and how we can abolish it, about the psychological impact of long-term solitary confinement at supermax, said that nearly complete isolation will test Guzman's resilience, if not his sanity. He continued, claiming that he can't predict how solitary confinement will impact El Chapo, but that inmates subjected to long-term isolation can experience panic, paranoia, compulsive behaviors, irrational anger, and despair. Despite all that, the ADX staff doesn't seem to be eager to change their methodology, much to the contrary. As a matter of fact, they praise the institution for being designed to successfully re-educate the most violent prisoners. According to them, after a long period of solitude and isolation, even the most desperate can become calm. It is believed there that by doing so, criminals are constantly encouraged to good behavior. For example, once they follow the rules and show obedience, they are given books and newspapers and can 
even be transferred. However, Robert Hood himself argues as being extremely against such beliefs. He said that when inmates complained to him, he would respond by stating, this place is not designed for humanity. I think that being there day by day, it's worse than death. When it's 23 hours a day in a room with a slit of a window where you can't even see the Rocky Mountains, let's be candid here, it's not designed for rehabilitation, period, end of story. Activists uncover the dark secrets of ADX. Several researchers claim that solitary confinement has devastating effects that are easily noticeable at ADX. Dr. Craig Haney, a psychology professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz, said the profound, lifeless feeling that permeates this regime has led some prisoners to a critical level of ontological insecurity. This condition makes the prisoner confused and not sure if they even exist, and if so, who they really are. Human rights defenders say that such studies prove that solely the conditions themselves are possible causes for such stress and trauma. As one of those activists, a man named David Cloud summarizes, even if you try to employ a solitary confinement with the most humane intentions, people are still going to lose their minds and hurt themselves. A legal team working on the lawsuit against the BOP evaluated 45 ADX prisoners and realized how massive the issue was. They estimated that 70% matched for at least one serious mental illness. The researchers heard stories of several prisoners that usually banged their heads on the wall and screamed through the night. Others who swallowed razor blades were shackled and handcuffed to their beds and left there for days, and one inmate who ate his own feces regularly, but only sparked concern over the staff psychiatrist when he did so with veracity. They also heard stories similar to Rodney Jones, of other inmates who were taken off prescribed medications and denied treatment, no matter how insistent their requests were. Facing such facts, researchers started to ask themselves how the toughest prison in the country had seemingly become a mental asylum, incapable of controlling its own population. Simultaneously, many inmates have been on new numerous hunger strikes, especially among the Islamic prisoners in the H unit. As a result, they have to be force-fed, restrained, and have a tube put in their nose that pours down liquid nourishment. There have been reportedly a dozen hunger strikes, with one of them being Wadi al Hage, Osama bin Laden's secretary. According to the Bureau of Prisons records, there have been as many as 900 involuntary feedings of terrorists in the unit since 2001. When asked what the complaint was behind the strike, Robert Hood simply answered, It was conditions of confinement. The fact is that all interviewed inmates and former prisoners have in common not very kind words towards their time at ADX, describing the place as having the purpose of gradually tearing a person down mentally and physically through environmental and physical deprivation, and a facility built to break the human spirit, psyche, and your mind. In other words, ADX is the perfection of isolation. The United States Penitentiary Administrative Maximum Facility in Florence, Colorado will surely continue to evoke much more discussion. Is it an achievement of the American penal system, or a notorious failure that proves how such a regime is outdated and needs to be reinvented? Wherever you stand on this discussion, if you like this content, make sure to click on one of the cards on the screen to watch similar videos. You'll have a better time watching them than in a supermax prison.